It's not about the person, it's not about what the CEO says, it's not about some squishy thing called culture. It's about structure. Culture is the patterns of behavior you see on the surface, you observe. Structure is the thing underneath that drives those patterns. Good evening. My name is Susan Spurlock. I'm the executive director of the Ford Hall Forum at Suffolk University, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this evening's program with Safi Bacall, the author of the just-released book, Loon Shots, How to Nurture Crazy Ideas That Win Wars, Cure Disease, and Transform Industries. So what do James Bond and Lipitor have in common? Why do traffic jams appear out of nowhere on highways? What can we learn about human nature and world history from a glass of water? Physicist and biotech entrepreneur, Safi Bacall, explores these. He makes revealing, surprising new ways of thinking about the mysteries of group behavior that challenges everything we thought we knew about radical breakthroughs. Bacall shows why groups will suddenly change from embracing wild new ideas to rigidly rejecting them, just as flowing water will suddenly change into brittle ice. Loon Shots is Bacall's first book. We're also honored to be joined by Andrew Paul McAvee, who is the evening's moderator. McAvee is a principal research scientist at MIT and studies how digital technologies are changing business, the economy, and society. Please join me in welcoming Safi Bacall. I'm going to start with a question. This is a glass of water. I can stick my finger in it and I can swirl it around. And that's true for any liquid, all the time, except as I gradually lowered the temperature, all of a sudden, the behavior completely changes. Those molecules go from sloshing around freely to completely rigid. Water freezes. It becomes ice. But the molecules inside are exactly the same. So how did they know to suddenly change? There's no CEO molecule with a bullhorn that's looking up and checking the temperature and saying, oh, I think it's 33, everybody slosh around. No, wait, it's 31, everybody line up. No, wait, it's 30. They somehow know to suddenly change. Why? And what I'm going to tell you about today is how understanding the answer to that question helped the Allies win the Second World War helped the U.S. lead the world in science and technology ever since, gives us a new way to think about innovation and what it means to be a great leader. What I won't have time to tell you about, but is true and is in the book, is it gives us another way to think about world history, why the world speaks English. So. I'm a physicist, I was a biotech entrepreneur. How did I end up here talking about World War II or even writing about it uh, in this book? It started about eight, uh, let's see, we're 2019, so it's eight, yeah, eight years ago I got a call from a former uh, professor who I was a teaching assistant for, actually at Harvard, not far from here. And he said, uh, Safi, I've been working the last few years with President Obama's Council of Science Advisors. And our job, what we're working on, is shaping the future of national research. What should we recommend to the president on the national research infrastructure of the United States, science and technology? And we'd like you to work with us. So there'll be a small hand group working on it. Uh, we'd like someone with biomedical experience and the physics experience and uh, at the time, I was running a public company, so public company, uh, private industry experience. So I didn't know anything about science, science policy, but I said yes. I figured uh, uh, they'd take one look at me and send me back, so I figured I'd go. 
they didn't. Amazingly, uh, they decided to um, engage me on that project, which I did. And the first day, uh, the chairman said, your job is to write the next generation of the Vannevar Bush report. And unfortunately, I'd never heard of Vannevar Bush <laughs> or his report. I started to think about maybe I'd made the wrong decision. But I did some fast reading, since we had a few months to write um, this recommendation for the president. And I discovered that Vannevar Bush was a remarkable engineer. He was a dean of engineering at MIT in the 1930s. He was an incredible inventor. He invented essentially the first computer, the first analog uh, computer, and kind of laid much of the foundation for what eventually grew into the internet and the personal computer industry. By the way, can I ask how many people here knew who Vannevar Bush was? That is about, well, you're at MIT. That totally doesn't count. Um, you didn't say I couldn't answer. You yeah, didn't say you couldn't answer. I'm subtracting your, how many people not at MIT? I would say 100% of the people at MIT, to first approximation, know who Vannevar Bush is because you can't walk you know, 50 feet at MIT without hitting a statue of him somewhere. Um, now, that, that seems to be about a pretty common. Not only was he a great inventor and uh, a remarkable engineer, he also uh, was a great entrepreneur. He started a company called Raytheon, which all of you have heard of, I'm sure. And he uh, was, in some sense, an organizational genius. He helped build MIT essentially to the leading technology university in the world, which it still is no. today, <laughs> Andrew. <laughs> Objections? <laughs> I'll just gonna, we're going to just move on. That's Vannevar Bush. In the late 1930s, Bush grew increasingly concerned. Why? I want to ask you to imagine something, which is not a very easy exercise. We all know how World War II played out. But I want you to go back in time. I want you to imagine you're living in this country in 1939, end of 1938, early 1939. There's rising fascism in Europe. And had you been a betting person, you would have been absolutely right to bet on Nazi Germany winning the war. Had there been prediction markets, they would have been probably overwhelmingly in favor of Nazi Germany. Why? Germany had these new submarines called U-boats, which look ready to strangle the Atlantic. Allies had no answer to them, and they did. First four years of the war, they absolutely did. They had these new planes for the Luftwaffe, which outclassed anything that any Allied Air Force had. And they looked ready to bomb Europe into submission, which is exactly what they did within weeks later that year. And two German scientists discovered something called nuclear fission in January of 1939, which put Hitler within reach, splitting the atom, which put Hitler within reach of the most dangerous weapon ever invented by man. Bush was in touch with many of the scientists fleeing Nazi Germany, Jewish refugees, many of them. And he was aware of the dangerous gap, the dangerous lead that Nazi Germany had. He also had been working with the US military since, as a young man in World War I, he'd worked with the US with, with the Navy to hunt submarines. And he knew that the US Navy had no answer for any of these technologies. So he quit his job. President of MIT said, understood how useful Bush was, how critical he was to the institution. He said, I will step down as president and make you president if you stay. And Bush said, no, the country is facing a national crisis, and its defense is going to be led from Washington. So he quit his job, talked his way into a meeting with President Franklin Roosevelt. And that 10-minute meeting, changed the course of the war probably more than any other. 
So what did Bush tell FDR? He handed him a piece of paper with three short paragraphs in the middle. What were on those paragraphs? To tell you what were on those paragraphs, I want to go back to that glass of water. I described the sudden change in the behavior of that glass of water. That sudden change in science and physics is called a phase transition. Solid is one phase, liquid is another phase. The sudden change between the two is a phase transition. Sounds fancy. That's all it is. It's a sudden change in behavior of a system of many, made of many parts. So I'm going to explain to you in 90 seconds every phase transition in nature. Every phase transition in nature is a result of two competing forces, a tug of war. Two competing forces acting on those individual parts. In the case of water, one of those forces wants to make water molecules run around and be free. That force is called entropy. Doesn't matter detail of what it means, it just wants to make stuff run around and be free. The other is called binding energy wants to lock water molecules rigidly into place, 2.7 angstroms apart, not 2.6, not 2.8, exactly 2.7 angstroms apart. Tug of war, two forces at high temperature, the entropy, the running around and be free winds. Binding energy is very weak. And as you lower those, as you lower the temperature, the entropy gets weaker and weaker, and the binding energy gets stronger and stronger, and boom, <coughs> boom, right at 32, those two things cross. Water freezes, and the system suddenly snaps. <coughs> and that's how every phase transition in nature works. I'm going to explain how that translates to teams, companies, and people in one second, but I actually found people enjoy all of you I expect have experienced a phase transition when you're driving. How many of you have been driving along on a highway, no problem, smooth flow, and all of a sudden you run into a massive jam of stalled cars and there's nothing around? There's no on-ramp, there's no exit ramp, there's no accident. How many of you have had that happen to you? Far more than the number of people who knew Vannevar Bush. Okay? You have all experienced a phase transition between smooth flow and jam flow. Here's how it works. Imagine you drive late at night and the next car is a couple hundred yards away. Squirrel rushes across the street. Driver taps on his brakes. What do you do? Nothing. So far away, you wait and see what happens. Nothing happens. You keep going. Now imagine that car, you're, it's near 5 o'clock, and that car is 30 yards away. Same thing, squirrel, driver, brake, flashes, one second. What do you do? You jam on your brakes. Why? You don't want to crash into that car. Well, now it's just a squirrel. The driver lets go of his brakes. No problem, you let go of yours. But that driver may have decelerated for two seconds. To get back up to speed takes you four seconds. The guy behind you takes him eight seconds. The guy behind him, 16 seconds. It grows exponentially into a jam. Two forces. Number one, you want to go at cruising speed. Number two, you don't want to hit the guy in front of you. When there are very few cars on the road, you go at cruising speed. But as it gets more and more dense, you start to worry about not hitting the guy in front of you, and boom, at a certain critical density, any small perturbation will cause it, will grow exponentially into a jam. Those are called phantom jams by traffic engineers. You can prove them experimentally. There was actually a beautiful experiment done in the Nagoya Dome in Tokyo with cars going around like a baseball field, and they demonstrated this as density increases. That's a phase transition that you experience every day. Now, what does this have to do with people, teams, companies, businesses, innovating faster and better and winning World War II? Excellent question. I am so glad you asked. <laughs> Imagine you have a small company. Let's just say a small biotech company, 10 people. You're working on a new cancer drug. 
two forces. Whenever you organize people into a group with a reward system and a mission type, sorry, with a mission, organize people into a group with a mission and a reward system tied to that mission, you instantly create two forces. Number one, stake and outcome. Everybody stake in that mission. Small biotech company, cancer drug works, boom, everyone's a hero and a millionaire. Stake and outcome is big. Cancer drug fails, boom, everyone's unemployed. Very big stake and outcome. Perks of rank, well, there's maybe one team captain, another, everyone else is a team member. Perks of rank may, doesn't really matter, right? You might get a few thousand more in salary, but that's irrelevant compared to a few million dollars or unemployed. Perks of rank are, sorry, perks of rank are small over here. Stake and outcome is huge over here. Now you imagine you are at a company, I'm just going to make up a name, totally hypothetical. Let's call it, I don't know, Pfizer. 100,000 people. Same project. Early, early stage projects, early stage drugs, early stage in any field always stumble and fail. They always have things that look promising and what we call warts, things that don't look good, experiments that haven't been done, flaws, thing, reasons you shouldn't, people believe they'll never work. In the small company, when Steak and Acoma, everybody unites around that loon shot. I call them loon shots. They're the small, crazy ideas that everybody writes off thinks is crazy, the champ thinks the champion is crazy. Everybody unites around that loon shot. At Pfizer, hypothetical company, let's say you're sitting around at a committee meeting. Your stake and outcome is, and you think you get the same project, same good things, same get bad things. What's your stake and outcome? Well, a good drug might sell a few hundred million dollars a year. How many people know or can estimate what is Pfizer's revenue, annual revenue? What did you say? 50? 20? 50. Two rights for 50. Actually, pretty good. Smart crowd. Boston crowd. $50 billion. So even if you bust your ass and work years and years and fight all the people who are trying to fight you for budget, you will move the needle by less than a percent. Your stake and outcome all of a sudden is very small. What about your perks of rank? Well, if you could sit at a, your round, the round table when you discuss that project and you can make some kind of smart aleck remarks about its flaws, about why you, know, you were at this keynote, a conference and the keynote and your buddy is this very smart professor, maybe an MIT, and uh, he uh, said to you that the industry is headed this way and that just happens to be what your boss thinks and her boss thinks, and they're both around the table. And you mention those things, and they're like, yes, yes, that young person has a very good head. Of head. I, you know, what might happen? You might get promoted. And then what happens? You get a 30% bump in pay. So, at Pfizer, promotions, perks of rank, outweigh stake and outcome. Two forces, somewhere between 10 per person company and the 100,000 person company, those two things shift. And incentives start driving in behavior that nobody wants. It favors politics rather than uniting around the crazy ideas, the innovation. So what does that mean? It gives us a very interesting and different way to think about the world around us. For example, I don't know how many of you are entrepreneurs or have been entrepreneurs or have friends who are entrepreneurs. But when I was a young entrepreneur, first starting out, we would get together after work, have drink, me and my buddies, and pat each other on the back about how we are all the innovative risk takers because we're at these small companies and all these uh, big corporate types at the large companies, oh, they're just so risk averse and that's why the great innovations come from people like us because those companies are full of risk averse people. Not the case. What would happen is, as we matured and as we grew up, we began to work with many of those companies. You're a small biotech, for example. You have to work with these large pharma companies. And then you go out to dinner, and they loved gadgets. They loved new things. They were just like us. In fact, when eventually we would hire those people, they became us. And then they would go back to their company, and they'd, you know, 
suit would go on again, tie on, and they start becoming kill you. They become a project killing conservative. Inside us, they'd become the next pounding the table. The tie would fly off, the jacket would, and they'd be pounding the table for some wild idea. That glass of water helps us understand this. What happens when we take a molecule of water and we drop it in a glass of water? It sloshes around with all the other molecules. And what happens when we take the same molecule and drop it on a block of ice? What does it do? It freezes right up. It's not about the per person. It's not about what the CEO says. It's not about some squishy thing called culture. It's about structure. Culture is the patterns of behavior you see on the surface, you observe. Structure is the thing underneath that drives those patterns. It's the organizational design and incentives. And that's what I will be talking about. And that's what Lundschatz is about. It's about structure rather than culture. So what does this have to do with Bush? What did Bush realize? Bush realized he couldn't change military culture. And this is one of the beautiful things about thinking about structure rather than culture, and setting aside the roughly 10 million books written on culture. Changing culture is hard. It's like pushing a battleship. Adjusting structure is much easier. It's like turning the rudder. So what did Bush do? I'm going to tell you, summarize what he did into three lessons, which you will get in the next 10 minutes. He started by recognizing not only would it be impossible for him to change military culture, which was rejecting all these new ideas one after the other, crucial new ideas. He didn't want to change military culture. The tight discipline and high quality and low risk organizations that they design, they design and have for a reason. They need to manufacture millions of guns, planes, and ships. They need to distribute them all over the world, and they need to direct millions of soldiers in battle, and you need that. That's the ice. That's the solid. That's the rigidity. You need that phase of human organization to accomplish those goals. But at the same time, you need the other phase where you nurture crazy ideas. Those are two completely different phases. And it's not that the military people were bad people. He was friends, and in fact, at the end, Bush said he preferred the company of military men to anybody else, to academics or politicians. Well, everybody prefers them to politicians. Right. But to academics, to, uh, to business type. It's not that they are bad people. It's that they are in a different phase of organization. And you need that phase. In fact, not only the military, but all teams and companies. If uh, Andy and I end up talking about more about how this applies to business today, we'll talk about how it applies to certain businesses. But in, in the military, you need both phases. You need the tight discipline. You need the rigidity. And Bush understood that you need to separate your artists and your soldiers. The creative scientists or engineers or designers working on radical, wacky stuff from the soldiers. Why? They speak different languages. They respond to different things. I'll give you an example. The English word risk. Well, that's one word. They, you would think that would have one meaning. But it doesn't. To a soldier, Risk is a bad thing for obvious reasons. You don't want to have a lot of risk walking onto a battlefield. You don't want to have a lot of risk manufacturing planes. To an artist, imagine saying, you have really de-risked your art. That's a horrible insult. They, I have found no risk in your artwork. That's exactly the opposite of what they want to hear. Artists, creative scientists, engineers, you want to try 10 things and see which eight fail so that you can pick out the 10 really good ones. That's what you want to do. Soldiers, if you're manufacturing planes, you don't want to launch 10 planes into the sky, sit back and say, well, let's see which eight crash. But we'll keep the two good ones. Like bombs? What? Like bombs? 
like Boeing. Thanks for that current hook reference. Um, ouch. Separate your artists and your soldiers. And that is the one exception to the rule that you can't have two phases coexist at the same time. There is a, it doesn't make sense that you can have two phases coexist in the same time. That's just basic science. You can't be liquid and solid at the same time, with one exception, right at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Right at 32, right on the cusp of a phase transition, you get two things. You get separation, blocks of ice form, pools of liquid form, phase separation, and then you get molecules traveling back and forth. They don't just sit there. You get something called dynamic equilibrium. Molecules melt off the surface of the ice and float into a liquid. Molecules from the liquid swim by the block of ice, lock on, and freeze. That is going to be a very, very important thing, and I'll explain why. Bush created life at 32 Fahrenheit. What was on that one sheet of paper that he, told Van, that he gave to FDR? He said to FDR, I want you to authorize a new group of the federal government reporting only to me, and I will report only to you. Phase separate. And I will mobilize, and this is what he told FDR, he said, I will mobilize the nation's scientists for war. I will develop the weapons that the military is unwilling to fund. Separate your artists and soldiers. That's what he did. Not because they're bad people, because they're different. And they need different homes and different incentives and different systems to operate. So what happened? How many of you have, know who Benedict Cumberbatch is? Many more than know who Vannevar Bush is, just for the record. How many of you know who Kira Knightley is? Even more. I'm glad to see that. I think she's awesome. Great actor. How many of you have seen the movie where Benedict Cumberbatch wins World War II by breaking, code breaking, breaking the German enigma? Lots of people seen that movie. Great movie. I am a fan, he's a great actor, so is she, um, based on a lie. Code Breaking play, played no role in turning the course of World War II for the simple fact that, um, <laughs> simple evidence is they broke the German Enigma machine for a few months in 1940, 1941, but, it was 41, 42, but the losses to U-boats grew from half a million in 1939 to a million in 1940 to two million, four million, four million, and eight million. They just kept growing exponentially. What is left out of that movie in almost all popular accounts, because it's kind of a downer, is that the German intelligence called Bedeinst had about 1,000 people working on breaking the British codes, and in fact had done a far superior job and we're reading essentially every British transcript from their admiralty to their navy from before the start of the war, from 1938 through the spring of 1943, which was discovered at the end of the war as they just read their own transcripts from the captured German soldiers and the captured German soldiers told them, written in a report and buried for about 40 years, only three copies of that report. It was released about 15 or 20 years ago, which is why most histories don't mention it, because Histories were written after and not updated very often. So, left out of the movie for obvious reasons. Still a good movie. That's not what turned the course of the war. What did turn the course of the war is a group that Vannevar Bush had developed. Bush quarantined a group of scientists in some secret buildings here at MIT called the Rad Lab. And they developed a technology called microwave radar. Why microwave? Well, radar means bouncing light off something and seeing what comes back. It's a detection device. You probably all know what sonar is. You bounce sound off something. That's how bats fly, how dolphins communicate, whales communicate, or navigate. Radar is bouncing light, but you can bounce light of any wavelength, of any frequency. So Britain had long wavelength, that's radio wavelength, radar, which was helpful in winning the Battle of Britain, actually was crucial in winning the Battle of Britain, 
unfortunately was useless in the Atlantic Ocean. It was useless against the U-boats. Why? Well, the size of the wavelength of the light determines the size of the antenna, which is why radio wavelength light, radio antennas don't fit in your kitchen, but a microwave does fit in your kitchen. It uses microwave energy. Microwave radar could go on planes. In the spring of 1943, March of 1943, the first Liberator bombers flew out over the Atlantic. And to give you the context, England was down to three months of oil. Three months of oil. Just think about that. Churchill knew it. Roosevelt knew it. Hitler and the, ad the Admiral of the German Navy knew it. Hitler had come around and realized that he was going to win the war with U-boats came around too late, or had he come around that earlier, he would have. But Hitler, at that point, understood that they had England and the Allies by the throat. What did tanks run on? Oil. What did planes fly on? Oil. What did trucks that transport troops require? Oil. And Britain was running on fumes by March 1943. And the U-boats were sinking more ships every month in the Atlantic than the Allies can build. March of 1943, these Liberator bombers with microwave radar, a couple other technologies developed by Vannevar Bush and his team of loons, a couple of loon shots, flew out over the Atlantic. And all of a sudden, they could see the U-boats. U-boats had been invisible, hiding in the dark, going to the surface shooting down the ships, disappearing. Planes out there, all of a sudden the U-boats were lit up, these little dots on their screen. And the planes began shooting them, shooting them down like fish in a barrel. Within 30 days, Germany lost one third of its entire U-boat fleet, within 30 days. Within the next eight weeks, it lost many more. And on May 20th of 1943, exactly almost 12 weeks after the first Liberator bombers with microwave radar um, began patrolling the Atlantic, after a massive loss of U-boats with no loss of Allied ships, Admiral Dunitz, the head of the German Navy, radioed all the U-boats in the Atlantic to withdraw. We have lost the Battle of the Atlantic. And the lanes were cleared to resupply England and to launch an allied invasion of Europe. And after that, there was, of course, a lot of blood loss and a lot of battles. But after that, the outcome of the war was inevitable. That's what turned the course of World War II. What are the lessons? I think of it, I have trouble, I don't have a great memory, I think of three visuals. Ice cube, garden hoe, and heart. Ice cube, create life at 32 Fahrenheit. That means separate your artists and your soldiers. Number two, the garden hoe. Be a gardener, not a Moses. Here's what I mean by that. There's this myth of the great leader stands on top of the mountain, and he's this holy man or woman who raises his staff and anoints the chosen loon shot, the chosen project, whether it's the iPod or whatever technology, boom. And everybody runs and does what he says. And that's how great companies are built. And that's not only is that a myth, that's not how great leaders have built great companies, but that's a disaster for reasons that we can talk about later. Bush, on the other hand, led like a careful gardener. He nurtured his artists and his soldiers. He managed the transfer, not the technology. The failure point in innovation is never the supply of ideas. There's tons of ideas. If you get good artists and good soldiers, the failure point is the transfer, because they speak different languages. The obvious one is 
from the artist to the soldier. So I have this beautiful baby idea. Why don't you go? Everybody just go use it. And in fact, that, as an example, is what happened with radar. The scientists here at MIT stood at the top of a building. They figured out the microwave technology. They said, oh, we can see. They, they aimed at the Boston Harbor. They had some you, you, you know, uh, submarines there. They said, we can see the submarines finally. Great gun, battle antic over. Here you go, guys. Knock yourself out. Nothing happened. Pilots didn't want to use it. Bush intervened, got FDR, got Stimson, got Stimson, the Secretary of War, on a plane to use the radar. And he said, holy cannoli. And he came back, and he left a note on the desk, personally, of every general in the Army and the Navy and said, I've seen this new radar technology. Why haven't you? That's the one way. The other way is missed even more by teams and companies. Everybody creates an innovation lab, but they miss this transfer. But the other way back is critical. Why? Projects never work the first time. The marketers, the product people, the soldiers, you have something that's selling well. You're paid on commission. What are you going to do? Sell more of that thing. Somebody comes along with a new product. It doesn't work very well. You have to spend days and weeks figuring it out. You have to call. It breaks down. Or you can just sell more of the old thing. What are you going to do? You have a home and a kid. It's not that you're a bad person. It's structure drives culture. If that's what you compensate people on, that's what they're going to do. So you have to solve that problem. So Bush finally got them to use it. Still nothing happened. Pilots had it in their plane, but they weren't using it. He was pulling his hair out. He said, all right, you sold it. It was the failure the other way around, because it wasn't working very well. So he got the scientists in the, cockpit and, in the cockpit and said, I want you guys to go in the cockpit, figure out what's going on. And they did, went in the cockpit, and they realized that when you're flying hundreds of miles an hour and people are shooting at you, the pilots, they had this, this box with 13 switches on it. They said, there's no freaking way I'm trying to figure out these 13 switches while people are shooting me. I just want to survive and get away from these bullets. So like, oh my god, the technology is fine. Our user interface is lousy. So they went back in the lab and they invented that oscilloscope with the sweeping line that you see in movies and the little dots, now called a PPI display, gave them the PPI display, and that was March of 1943. That's when the pilots began using radar. And as soon as they got that, they began shooting U-boats like fish in a barrel. Be a gardener, not a Moses. Don't manage the technology, manage the transfer. Number three, number one was the ice cube, separate your artists and soldiers. Number two, be a gardener, not a Moses. Number three, and this may sound soft and fuzzy, but it might be the most important lesson of all, especially today, where so many people get this wrong. Love your artists and soldiers equally. Love your artists and soldiers equally. Here's what I mean by that. There's this glorification of the heroic, inventor, creative genius. How do you think that makes all the regular people who are getting the job done feel? Now, anyone who's been an entrepreneur or created new products knows that the idea is getting the ball, having the idea is getting the ball from your goal to your five-yard line. Manufacturing it, finding the right customers, finding the right marketing, delivering it consistently, on time, on budget, on spec to customers, is the other 95 yards. And too often today, CEOs who get obsessed with innovation, innovation, and they just focus on those five yards. They just focus on the 5% of the artists who are working on the crazy new idea. I have a friend at a magazine very well-known magazine. We're discussing an article by me on this topic. And the first thing she said is, this is so my workplace. I'm trying to put out a magazine every 30 days. And senior management is just all over whoever's squeaking the loudest about the latest innovative toy. Podcast this, blah, 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 blah. And you know, there are 95% of us who are busting our butts trying to put out a magazine every single month. How does that make us feel? Demotivated. Love your artists and soldiers equally. Part of the reason that Bush succeeded where 
every scientist before him failed is that he respected the military. He understood them, worked with them, and understood to win a war you need both. And the same is true for teams, companies, and businesses. If you have a franchise that's succeeding and crazy new ideas that you think will be the next thing, you need balance. You need to keep the franchise going and keep the people who are working on that motivated, and these people motivated too, neither one dominating the other. So, ice cube, separate your artists and soldiers, garden hoe, be a gardener, not a Moses. Number three, love your artists and soldiers equally. So that's where I'm gonna stop, and I have no idea, because we, I talked, I don't know, a couple months ago, I, and Andy, I'm enormously grateful that he agreed to come moderate tonight, and I have no idea what we're going to talk about, so we'll find out next. Thank you. And I want to tell just one quick story before I, I start peppering Safi. Uh, he and I were introduced by a mutual friend and author, and the rec uh, I got the ask to come here tonight and be part of this event, and um, I said yes frankly, because I've got a book coming out this fall, so I want favors to come back to me. Uh, but when I heard that it was a book about innovation, I gotta confess I was not really excited about it. Uh, lots of books about innovation are frankly lousy. The best thing you can say about them is that they're an article blown up to a book. The worst thing you could say about them is that they shouldn't even have been that article. So one more book about innovation was really not something that I thought I needed in my life until I read the book. And Holy Toledo, there are actual ideas in here that I, this is supposed to what I do for a living, there are actual ideas in here I haven't come across before, woven together with very cool, well-told stories, some of the well-known stories about innovation and some deeply unknown ones to me. So this is a long-winded way of saying, go buy this book, please, when we're done tonight. This was a joyous read and I learned a ton from it, so thank you for writing that. Um, I thought, and I thought you were here just because you liked me. Whether or not those first two things are true, uh, I am really interested in, in picking your brain about a couple of things. The, the first question I had as I was reading the book and especially listening to you tonight, can Moses learn to garden? That's a great question. I, I am proud of it. <laughs> the, it's a very common trap. It's a very common trap because especially for entrepreneurs who start out and get lucky. Because a lot of success is luck. You have to have the right product at the right time, in the right place, with the right people around you. So those who start off, especially engineers who, uh, or people who see themselves as great product people, decide that they are great product geniuses. And then they grow and they grow and they become Moses. So there's a famous, uh, um, I'm gonna tell a not very famous story to answer, or example to answer that question of a very famous person. I almost didn't use it because he's too famous and I really didn't want to talk about it, but it is somewhat stunning how people don't appreciate what really happened. So that's Steve Jobs. It's kinda... You cannot write a book about innovation and not tell a Steve Jobs story. It's an unwritten law of this right. field. So I, you know, this, as Andy says, it's a very different book. I've got a mathematical set of, there's actually, as far as I know, in the history of books with ideas that are practical about management, there's never been one with an equation in it that's derived from first principles. So that's one thing that is different. And I was trying to be different about everything, but that was such a good example. Um, and it allowed me to tell a lot of movie stories, and I like, movies, and so I have James Bond and Star Wars and Toy Story, because movies is what ultimately turned Steve Jobs around. So when Steve Jobs first started, he was that guy who loved his artists and demeaned his soldiers. He got, he was in the right place in the right time and came across Steve Wozniak and started, built the Apple II, and that was a success for actually a very brief blip of time. It was rapidly surpassed, you know, Commodore, Pet, Actually, Tandy Radio Shack. I used to have a TRS-80 when I was a kid. Of all things, Radio Shack today rapidly surpassed Apple. And then within a year or two, IBM came and just cleaned out everybody. And uh, 
Jobs was trying to work on the franchise Apple III and Lisa, and that just didn't go very well. So eventually they directed him to another kind of skunk's work project that was just sitting in a corner called the Macintosh Project. Took it over from the guy who had had the idea for that project, got that guy fired, took it over. And then he created such enormous hostilities, he said, we are the true artists, we're working on the great thing, everyone else working on franchises is a bozo. The street between the two buildings was called the DMZ, the demilitarized zone, because there was so much hostility between those. The people who were working on the franchises took out these little red signs with Bozo the Clown with a line through them, we are not bozos. But still, it was too late. It was just such hostility that tons of people left on both sides. It was just not a good place to work, including Steve Wozniak, who was working on great stuff for the Apple Free. That was an example of someone who began as a Moses. He started seeing himself as this great artist and this great product designer, created enormous hostility, and because of that was justifiably asked to leave or demoted and eventually left. Twelve years later, we could talk about what changed and where he learned it. He really ended up learning it from the film business. He bought Pixar for their computer. Turns out they had this film thing going and this little film called Toy Story turned out to do pretty well and made him a billionaire. Um, but in the film industry, you have to love your artist. Anyone who ever makes a film, it's a lot like drug discovery. Drug takes 10 years and you need the creative biologist and chemist, but you need you know, the regulatory people and marketing and it's obvious both sides know they need each other. So in film and in drug discovery, artists and soldiers coexist and they know they have to coexist. And that's what he got out of film. And in 1997, when he was asked back to Apple as a Hail Mary play, because he was at that point kind of ridiculed in the uh, technology industry, the next company that he started had flopped. The uh, uh, Pixar image computer that he bought the Pixar company for had flopped. And he had learned to love his artists sold and soldiers equally. Who did he have? Johnny Ive, kind of the ultimate product designer artist on the one hand. Tim Cook. He was known as the Attila the Hun of inventory in his previous job at Compaq, the ultimate soldier. He learned to love them equally, create balance, tailor the systems, and he didn't lead like a Moses, despite the popular mythology. He led like a gardener, much more like Vannevar Bush. And when he was dying and asked what his greatest innovation was, he said, I think my greatest innovation was how I designed the organization. And as, as testament to that, Tim Cook now runs the company. You'd think that Jobs would have anointed the, the, the mini artist or the mini Moses down there, but he actually didn't. That's right. And his successor was the soldier, not the artist. Okay, so if the bar for people who can do this is at Vannevar Bush and Steve Jobs, is there any hope for us mere mortals that, that, that we can learn to you know, live at 32 degrees and skate between two phases and do it with, with some, some acumen? Yeah, no, that's, uh, th those are just good examples. One is the you know, greatest story of good and evil in the last 100 years. Um, but it applies to you know, lots of companies. But one question I get often is, how does it apply to small companies? Let's say you have 20 people or 10 people, or even just you. How do you separate your artists and soldiers? When you're a larger company, you can separate by role. Mm. When you're smaller, you separate by time. What you want to do is be mindful of the artist role and the soldier role, and that you need both, and they require different hats. So if you're one person or five people or 10 people, what you want to do is block off, let's say a week. Mm. Put on your artist hat and say, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do really wacky, crazy stuff. I'm going to suspend all the usual metrics and ways of measuring and ways of thinking about on time, on budget. And we're just going to go for quality and failure. We're going to try to maximize failure. We're going to try to think of all the craziest possible things, relaxing, suspending disbelief. At the end of that week, we're going to take off our artist hat, put on our soldier hat, and say, that was great. We're going to pick the two out of the 10 or 20 ideas that are the best. 
And now we're going to focus on minimizing risk. We're going to focus on operationalizing them. So that's what you do if you're a smaller team or a smaller company. And the lesson translates to be very aware, be mindful of the artist and the soldier, but they're different hats rather than different people. Got it. We're going to open this up fairly quickly. I want to do a final thing with you, which is kind of a, a lightning round. And I'm going to name some companies that a lot of us have heard of. And I want you to just share your impressions about how good a job they're doing at the stuff you write about in the book. Okay? We have not rehearsed this at all. Tesla. Terrible. In, in what way? I think Elon Musk is, am I on the record here? Yes, you are. <laughs> I think Elon Musk is almost the ultimate example of a Moses. Okay. He is the engineer, and he's dictating the engineering. He is Steve Jobs version 1.0. Okay. And that is overwhelming him, not just his company. And there's no, there's no gardening, there's no respect for the soldiers, there's no Tim Cooking going on that you can see. Well, it's a, you know, obviously I'm not inside, so it's yep. hard for me to talk in detail. But certainly from the outside, that looks like the ultimate example of the popular myth of a great hero, which is actually exactly the opposite of what, of a, the popular myth of a great leader, which is exactly the opposite of what you want for a great leader. General Electric. Wow. That is an incredible example of two words that should be stricken out of the English language forever. And those two words are disruptive innovation. <laughs> so disruptive innovation, I think, led that company. I mean, they did have the problem with the artists and the soldiers, but they, they were trying. What ha the disruptive innovation, the problem with all these people talking about disruptive innovation is disruptive innovation is backwards looking. It's very easy to say, oh, Walmart disrupted the retail industry, or the transistor disrupted electronics. But at the time, Sam Walton was forced to live in a small town because his wife didn't want to live in a big city. He really wanted to start in a big city. He had no idea that opening a store and selling stuff cheaper would disrupt the industry. He's not saying, let me disrupt the industry by going and living in Bentonville, Arkansas. His wife was like, I just don't want to live in St. Louis. He's like, well, he liked being married, and he liked quail hunting, and it was good for quail hunting, so that's where he located. The transistor, when they first, they were thinking about... Oh, hold on, come back to GE. We're oh, GE. So the we're, we're learning Safi can tell stories for a long time, right? Yeah, GE. that is we're learning. Have you met my wife? <laughs> General Electric. General Electric. <laughs> the problem with following some guru with a PowerPoint saying this is going to be disruptive in 10 years is that you take your eyes off the ball of nurturing wound shots, of challenging the beliefs to your existing product that could make all the difference. In 2016, I remember seeing an interview with um, Immelt where he said, we are obsessed with disruption. We're just focusing on disruption. That's what we're all about, disruption, disruption, disruption. I was thinking, this is not going to be pretty. And in fact, in the next 18 months, I think it was about 18 months, GE lost a third of its market value, roughly, was it, it was well over $100 billion. You focus too much on disruptive innovation, what's happening is you're over-focusing on the artists, and not enough on the balance between the two, and not in the right way. Amazon. I think Amazon's doing a very good, I don't have, inside knowledge in Amazon, but from what you can see, Amazon is, what's coming out of Amazon is not only excellence in execution, but also very high rate of innovation. And I think the difference with Amazon and many companies is that Amazon is running on a low margin business. And when you're running on a low margin business, you have very little room for error, so your soldiers have to be very, very tight. But it also appears that they're not afraid to try things and fail and do some loon shots. Like I have an Alexa on my kitchen counter. Exactly. How does that come out of a low margin business? That's because he separates his artists and his soldiers and does a good job of managing them differently. When a, a Bezos or any good leader is talking to his soldiers, he puts on his hat of <laughs> what's your margin, what's your return rate, etc. When he's talking to his crazy people, idea, is crazy idea, people. Um, he's talking about, why haven't you failed more? Why? 
one of the things your book helped me understand is that um, Bezos appears to be a really, really good gardener in the way that you define him. Do you have a better example that you like to toss out of somebody who's alive, not like Steve Bush and, and Vannevar, uh, Steve Jobs and Vannevar Bush, of, of a present day corporate really great leader gardener? Uh, what surprised me as I was doing research is what's going on at Microsoft. Oh, yeah, so I have uh, some friends inside Microsoft Research. So Satya Nadella, when he took over, one of the folks running the, there was a crazy idea group inside Microsoft, which uh, you may know some of those people. I know some of those people. They really have incredible autonomy and are really motivated like scientists, like artists. Satya Nadella came in and he said, I don't think you guys are crazy enough. And he took one of those people and said, I want you to create a new group which will work on the ideas that are too crazy for the crazy idea group. So it's like the crazy squared ideas. Okay. And I think he's done a remarkable job of leading as a gardener, managing the soldiers the way soldiers need to be managed and managing the artists the way they should be managed and the balance between the two. Great. Please. That, that was a great segue. I'm glad you brought up Microsoft because I wanted to ask you specifically about Microsoft. Uh, as you probably know, uh, there may be another way uh, for employees to uh, take a uh, stake in the outcome. Uh, last month, a group of employees wrote a letter to your friend RJ as well as to Brad Smith, in which they said, we are a global coalition of Microsoft workers and we refuse to create technology for warfare and oppression. We are alarmed that Microsoft is working to provide weapons technology to the United States military helping one country's government, uh, quote unquote, increase lethality using tools we built. We do not sign up, we did not sign up to develop weapons and we demand a say in how our work is used. So I don't know whether Ajay is having second thoughts now about uh, releasing his innovative uh, strategy within the company, but what if uh, the workers want to be, uh, or the artists want to be permanently separated from the soldiers, uh, literally? You know, it's a very difficult question and different people are gonna answer that in different ways. It also depends on the distance. Let's say you work on Microsoft Word. Well, the military might use Microsoft Word. So should you stop working on Microsoft Word? On the other hand, let's say you're working on manufacturing bullets. Well, it's pretty clear what bullets are supposed to do. So I think it becomes a question of the distance and then per personal ethics. If you have an ethical issue that interferes with your personal decision making, then you are absolutely justified in leaving if that's what you want to do. But let me try to broaden this out because there's a really interesting concept here, which is that y you might have different tribes of soldiers and artists, right? Some folk that you might think of as just turning out the product being soldiers might have an ethical stance that's th that might make them kind of outliers or artists with respect to some things that your company is doing. Is this a, is this a multi-dimensional problem, soldiers versus artists? Yeah, I mean, obviously for purposes of discussion, we're kind of simplifying yeah. things, but, you know, and, and in fact, you don't want to oversimplify. It's not that soldiers do nothing but march in formation and artists do nothing but have you know, smoke weed and have crazy dream sessions. The soldiers who are delivering stuff on time, on budget, on also innovate in how they get things to customers and how they uh, manufacture their products. So we're simplifying a little bit for the purposes of discussion, but there's innovation happening everywhere and there's execution. It's just what's the primary objective. I want to know if, yeah, to apply the concept of the gardener, um, and that communication between the two groups to the, you know, what's become the hot thing in software development, which is this agile scrum method where it's almost like those two sides are like really intimately linked um, in real time. And is that, is that a good model to promote innovation or is that like, are they too much in each other's face and not separated yeah, enough? Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up. In many ways, the purpose of agile development or scrums... Give us the idiot's guide to what that is. It's about a... a it's basically rapid iteration. Try something, see what doesn't work, get the feedback. It's essentially what I was doing, talking about the transfer of the dynamic equilibrium. Take the idea from the artist, soldier, back, boom, boom, boom. It sounds a little more artist-friendly than soldier-friendly. Is, is that accurate? Well, it's about... It's both, because it's really designed for the balance. 
between both. And it's a way to operationalize that, create a set of rules that everybody, a team can follow to do this back and forth. Here's the problem that I have with something that's out there that often comes with the Agile Scrum methodology stuff, which is a fast fail and pivot, which is everywhere. And here's the problem with fast fail and pivot. You know what fast fail and pivot is? Whether or not I do, I'm not sure everybody in the room fast does. Fast fail and pivot, that's true. If you spend any time around, it means, oh, if something doesn't work, give up quickly, pivot, move to some other product. Problem with that is if you look at the great breakthroughs, the loon shots that ultimately transform the world, they fail many times before they succeed. In fact, if you failed once and pivoted, then probably everybody else failed once and pivoted, which means that the pot of gold there is waiting to be discovered. I'll give you one example, the statins. How many people in the room, firstly, know what a statin is, Lipitor, Crestor? How many people take statins or know somebody? How many people know somebody who takes statins? Okay, 35 million people take statins. When that idea was first invented, the idea of lowering blood cholesterol by a Japanese scientist named Akira Endo, people said that's an incredible, it'll never work because every cell in your body has cholesterol. And the first trials to value lowering cholesterol failed, everybody gave up. A small number persisted until he tried it in mice and wrote the, the first animal studies and he was so hopeful, 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 it failed. Every single group in the industry gave up, except for him. As it turns out, nobody knew, statins only lower bad cholesterol, LDL. And mice, the standard experiment, don't have LDL cholesterol. So millions of lives were saved because he didn't fast fail and pivot. So, Agile Scrum is a great way to get this rapid transfer, but the issue I have with it is the fast fail and pivot that comes along. Okay, but then talk a little bit more to us about how you know when to kill something that sounds crazy, because most things that sound crazy are crazy. The way I think about it is, is listen to the suck with curiosity. When someone tells you- there, There's a mantra for you, wait. <laughs> Say that, so I, unpack that. So I, I have a, uh, I don't have a great memory, so I think of it as LSC, and it's kind of one of the ways I detect, think about when should I, what is the difference between persistence and stubbornness? When should I give up? And flat out stupidity. And flat out stupidity. Am I probing why the experiments failed? Why investors are walking away? Why a partner is rejecting? It's hard to hear someone say they don't like your baby, it's even harder to keep asking why, right? So the way I tell, for me, my own temperature check, should I give up or should I keep going is, if someone says I don't like your baby, I'm not buying, do I wanna, you know, it's a stupid idea, do, you wanna, do I react by wanting to punch them and slap them? Or do I set that aside and say, walk me through what it is you're thinking about why you don't choose to buy my product. Double click on your hatred of my idea and let, let's unpack that a little bit. Yes, exactly. So okay. I think about it's time to give up if you're answering all your objectors by wanting to punch them and dismissing them and, and ridiculing them, then it's probably time to move on. If you're really probing and you figured out what it is that's the problem and it's a solvable problem, then you keep going. Um, I want to change the di direction a little bit. Um, I'm thinking about your metaphors and soldiers. I'm thinking of workers. I'm thinking about this country. And I'm thinking about how we could have artists, creative people, and workers in the same family. And a good family is going to have people who can work, who can take care of how the lights go around, how the internet works, how you get everything. And someone, children, or adults who can be really creative about things, who know, hey, do we want to live here on the lake? Do we want to live in the city? Or what do we, some greater thought that goes into it. We need both of those. Does, does this get us to a question for Safi? And the question is, can you find a company that has both of those? And does that company have to have equal men and women? Or can we do it in some other way? 
have you have, have you crossed this with with gender? Have you crossed your work with? Uh... Uh, I have not done a statistical analysis, but I have. I think there are phenomenal artists who are men and phenomenal artists who are women. There are phenomenal soldiers who are men. And by soldiers, we're speaking metaphorically. It's really about... Executors. People, how you think about risk. Do you try to reduce risk or do you try to increase risk? I don't think that has anything to do with gender. And it's also not that... Well, they're also they're very creative people. It's what your job is at that time. So if you're inside a group, your job may be to de-risk, get things done on time, on budget, consistently. Or your job may be to create wacky new ideas. And you could take the same people and switch roles, and they may or may not be good, but I don't think those are genetic. I think you can nurture both and be both. Your book also deals with levels of analysis way above the company. You talk about countries, you talk about economies. Uh, So again, lightning round question, how's America doing? If we put your lens on, do we have the, uh, how's our balance? Do we have the right percentage or are we over-focused on artists or soldiers? Do we have gardeners? How would you how well, I think that, analyze yeah, us? That's a good part. I actually left that out. Uh, the Vannevar Bush created this organization called the OSRD. That evolved into the National Research Infrastructure. That became the National Science Foundation, the National Institute of Health, yep. DARPA, and it is that organization, that separation of the creative artists and the soldiers in the United States that led to the discovery of the transistor, the personal computer industry, uh, the biotechnology industry, all of which were funded with federal research. I would argue, and I think there's a strong case, that much of the dominance of the United States and the world economy over the last 70 years has been due to that separation, due to the system that Vannevar Bush inspired. In fact, the Nobel Prize was awarded for showing roughly half of the trillion dollars of the many trillions of dollars of growth since World War II was due to new technologies. I think what you point out is a real danger, which is we're starting to reverse that. China and other countries have figured that out. They're doing the same thing that we are, especially China. And the worst thing we could do is decrease our investment, which is starting to happen in the current administration, in national research. Okay, well, I've just appointed you, Vannevar Bush, for the new millennium. There's a president who's going to read the memo that you wrote and act on it. What are your three paragraphs going to say? I have to say in one line, double the investment in national research. And do we need to change the org structure as well, or do you think it's basically working, the, the, the descendants of what Bush set up? No, I, no you're, there's uh, some things we can do on the margin. The NIH and the NSF have now gotten very big, and so they've gotten a lot more bureaucratic than they used to be. Okay. So there is some breaking up that could be done. But in general, you, like, we got to double down on this thing. Double down because China is catching up among other countries. Great. Sir? I guess most of your examples have been from the private sector, except for the the World War II, which was in, uh, in the context of the war. Uh, my uh, my question is, how would these principles apply to, generally to the operations of government? Uh, you know, in, in terms of just normal pol- policies, you know, you're trying to solve issues. I suppose you could throw out Medicare or, or so forth, but uh, what um, uh, or is the government somehow different from the pri- uh, private uh, sector? No, this is when we go beneath the, you know, beyond the metaphor and just mm-hmm. kind of work out the science of what happens when you create groups and think about the underlying incentives, it applies to any group with a mission or a award system mm-hmm. type. And so it applies more broadly. If you need to get things delivered on time, on budget, on spec, whether you're in a, a large organization, in a, a private sector or, pub, or a public sector, you want to have artists and soldiers. And if you have no artists at all in your large department, you're just going to do the same thing over and over. You're going to be stagnant. So wherever you want innovation, wherever you want sustainable innovation. Now, the reason the federal government should do this is that it's in a, we're in a competitive world. The United States is not static. We're competing against nations in Europe, nations in Asia, and if we want to grow and evolve, we need to fix our national government problems, and we do that 
by creating innovation inside the government as well. One of, one of the things I've heard is that the reason we see so little innovation inside government is because you get beat up so hard for anything, any kind of artistic failure, any experiment that didn't work, any innovation that didn't play out. I just saw headlines today about Solyndra, that, that uh, solar energy company that failed 10 years ago and we're still using that to flog the other side. You know, how do you, how do, would you address this problem? That is an example of structure. It's from the top, how are you incentivizing people? If you are saying, if you take any risk, you will be punished. What if the public says that, I think is my question. What if the press, what if you get tried in the court of public opinion? That's the job of leaders. That the job of leaders is not to follow public opinion, but to help shape public opinion. And if you want a government that innovates, of course there's the people who will highlight examples of failure to flog people. You need to understand as a leader that that is exactly what will kill innovation. And therefore you need to step up and say, we want to take risks, we will have, and that's... And to say, there will be future failures, that's for example. You know, okay. The guys at Google said that all the top leaders, that is the big problem, that people will be embarrassed by failure. There's only one answer. Leaders have to lead, not follow. Great. I think I have one final question for you, and then we'll see if this is a, 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 has to be a fantastic wrap-up question. So only if you have a really great wrap-up question. As, as somebody who writes books like you do, one of, the, one of my favorite things is learning something brand new in the course of your research for the book. What, what did you learn? What did you come across? What was fantastically new and cool for you after you decided to write the book and while you were doing the research in the background for it? I would say so much history and stories that I were told that I believed were true were false. Ooh. Starting with, you know, code breaking one World War II. Like, that's just wrong, is that what you're telling us? The, the narrative we know about the, uh, saving the, the, the Atlantic convoys, the dominant narrative is just wrong. It's just wrong. It's a, okay. great, it's a simple... And it's kind of a fascinating question of why that narrative persists, even though it's just factually wrong. You could just look at the data, look at the numbers, and then look, read the historians of what really happened. So many of those stories, the stories even of Steve Jobs, the stories of Edwin Land, the stories of Pan Am, but the story of why we dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. So many of those stories, or saved a million lives, so many of those stories, when you peel back what really happened, they were nothing like the popular narrative. And did you know this on the way in, or how, how did you find these stories that supported your points? I had some sense I wanted to tell this story. I think there's something there about how, and I found a weird thread. I'd be reading, reading, and I was like, wait, what? I'd be deep in some academic historian article and there would be, well, U-boat losses kept increasing during World War II. And I was like, I thought code break, and if code breaking happened here, why did U-boat losses keep increasing? You know, I, I read that, uh, you know, dropping the bomb on Hiroshima turned the course of, you know, is why the Japanese surrendered. But it was the 69th, there were no cities left in Japan. They'd, they'd known the war was lost for two years. And when they met on August 9th at the time of Nagasaki, they didn't even know. But they didn't discuss the nuclear bombs. When they decided to surrender, they barely knew of it, were barely aware of it, and weren't even aware of the second bomb. So how could that narrative, what's going on? I probably spent you know, eight weeks reading the historians' historical papers to just sort of tease out the truth of what really happened. And there are just many examples like that. I, I want to thank you very much, um, and Andrew, thank you for your extraordinary moderating of the evening. And most importantly, I want to thank you for coming to the Ford Hall Forum at Suffolk University and being part of the conversation, and I hope to see you at future forums. Thank you again.